Good morning. I'll explain the smile on my face a little later, but first to serious business. Trade unionists throughout British Columbia are very angry at Terry Segerty, the Minister of Labour, with all his changes and new regulations and whatnot. And they say it's going to bring back the era of walking wounded. People not getting proper compensation in factories and plants in British Columbia. Terry Segerty. He's been in the job since February. Also on this morning's program, we're going to correct something that the Minister of Immigration, Flora MacDonald, told me when I was discussing with her immigration abuses, courier parents, the other day. And here is the precise uh, part of my interview where that misinformation was accidentally given to me by the minister. The Liberals in 1978 changed the age of parents who could be brought in from 60 to 40. Well, it's been changed again. It's back up to 60. When was it changed up to in 60? In 1982. Are you sure it's up? It changed again. And this makes a, a material difference to the problems of immigration abuses in British Columbia. I've got the correct facts for you, and I'll deal with it later this morning because it's a matter of some importance. And then I've got a man here, a man with a thousand jobs. He was unemployed for quite some time, a highly skilled man. So he made his own job, and he may be finding a job for you if you can afford to buy his service, and his name is Bernard Fay. But first, the leprechaun-type Minister of Labor, Terry Segerty, after the break. Before we talk about compensation uh, board changes with Terry Segerty, the Minister of Labor in Victoria, let me ask you another question. Why have you allowed non-union em employers on the Expo site not to pay the fair wage minimum? I'm told that the Carpenters Union have got 30 affidavits of men being paid as low as $5 an hour. Why don't you lay the wood on these people? Well, Jack, as you know, the uh, Expo Corporation are responsible for enforcing the uh, Fair Wage uh, Act and the Federal Fair Wage Act and uh, the Ministry of Labour uh, staff and myself will provide any support and assistance we can uh, to uh, employees who have uh, not been dealt with in a fair way. Uh, my deputy and the Employment Standards Branch of the Ministry of Labour have been working very closely with the, part, with, uh, the uh, well, uh, individuals. You're in just giving me the routine political answer. No, uh, but you could lay the wood on them and give them a phone call and say, for goodness sake, pay the proper wages. Well, what makes you think we haven't done that? Well, the Carpenters Union tells me you haven't done it. Well, uh, Jack, uh, I know that uh, we've been in touch with the Expo Corporation, and uh, yes, it's true, there are some violators of it, uh, but uh, where we can, uh, uh, we assist the uh, individuals in those areas and uh, make sure that they receive the benefits that are owing to them under the, under the Federal Act. Let's get the compensation board changes. And I've been told by three or four unionists in the last couple of days that your new policy of... Um, changing the assessment to penalize employers, specific companies with poor injury records, is going to result in the return of the walking wounded. In other words, if you want to keep your job, don't report the injury. Come, don't report the injury. Come back sooner. Stay off shorter. Is there not a chance that this will happen? Jack, I've been meeting with industrial health and safety committees across British Columbia since February, and, uh, and uh, I, don't, uh, I have more uh, faith in the, uh, in the individuals who work in the plants uh, uh, than that. I know that if there's an individual who's wounded, uh, hurt on the job, and is entitled to compensation, they were going to receive uh, fair benefits. You should also know that it's a violation of the Workers' Compensation Act uh, to, for an employer to uh, carry on such practices, and in 1985, you can be fined $10,000 uh, for, uh, for encouraging but an employee going well, sure, back to work. You, you know the point I'm getting to. Yes. What is the precise change you've made in the assessments of individual operations which could lead to this? Jack, all we have done is uh, said to em the employer community in British Columbia that it's, it's now going to be, uh, it's no longer going to be cheaper to pay the workers' compensation assessment or fine than it is to uh, comply with industrial health and safety regulations. And uh, from the industrial plant and safety committees that I've met uh, throughout the province since February, that's an area that uh, they had a lot of concern about. And we made the change to accommodate their interest and to send a strong message to British Columbians 
that safely pays in our province. But you have changed it, whereby instead of an industry rating, there's going to be an experience rating in certain types of plants, correct? An experience rating within an industry category. Right, and that, uh, an employer with a bad record is liable to get 33% more in his assessment, isn't That's it? right, and uh, one with a good record is going to get 33% less. But in these days of kind of tough employment conditions and fellows being in insecure about their job, maybe it wasn't such a smart thing to do. Well, Jack, i got to tell you that uh, the meetings that I've had with those committees across the province where job steward and supervisor alike uh, sits on those committees, the level of cooperation between those two parties is just heartwarming indeed to see it. And, uh, you know, you have some politicians in the top end of the, of the uh, labour community that it doesn't matter what you do, they're going to object and complain to it. But uh, I have been a chairman of an industrial health and safety committee uh, member of the IWA for a long period of time before I became an MLA and uh, I served on those committees. I know the function that, uh, that uh, they uh, provide and uh, I'll tell you their interest is in safety in the workplace and looking after their membership and they've got little interest in politics. Let's turn to something else. What have you done to try and get rid of the 5,000 backlog in the Board of Review Appeals? You're still as slow as snails, aren't you? Yeah, you're right. Uh, I mean, it's disgraceful. You did absolutely 64 boards of review in 1984, and 39 of these approved, uh, 64 approved uh, changes by the board of review, and 39 of them were turned down by Fletcher. Well, no, uh, just hang on a second on that. Uh, number one, we made some legislation. The boards of review are not. Uh, governed by the Workers' Compensation Board. It's supposed they're, to be independent. Uh, they're under the Ministry of Labour, and uh, the, the, the chairman of the Boards of Review reports directly to the Minister of Labour. It is a very sad situation, Jack, without question, where an individual has to wait for two years to get their, their uh, appeal uh, or their case it's reviewed. It's Absolutely. And uh, we made some legislative changes uh, during the summer. Uh, we've been interviewing uh, new people to sit on the Boards of Review, that process now is well underway and I hope to have it fully implemented with a new administrative chairman of the Boards of Review by January or as close as we the can. The other guy uh, left. That's right. Mr. Levy uh, left uh, uh, a few months ago. Back to my point though, of 64 appeals approved by the Boards of Review, 39 were overturned by the Commissioner. Well, no, uh, Jack, uh, more... They At 60% of the uh, uh, claims approved, rejected at the Board. No, number one. Uh, an individual who makes application to the workers' compensation for compensation benefits, 95% of them go through the system without too much difficulty. Correct, on the overall picture. That's right. 4% of them go, uh, or 5% would we'll say, go to the boards of review. Of that 5%, only 3% are referred to the commissioners. And uh, it's not just Flesher. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a commissioner panel set up and uh, they review those uh, cases. They're extremely difficult and uh, sometimes they rely on the medical review uh, to provide them with the necessary information on the, on the question of... You'll never clear up the 5,000 backlog, will you? Yes, we How will. How many do you do a year? Uh, Jack, under the new Act, uh, we have the authority to appoint new boards of review. Uh, the government has made a commitment that we're going to appoint as many as necessary to clean up the backlog. Once we have it cleaned up, an individual should only have to wait no more than 10 days to get it done. But it will take us, Jack, and I want to be honest with right. you, 14, 15 months to clear up the entire backlog. The trade union movement was complaining too about the appointment of Joe Miyazawa as the chairman of a board of review panel, weren't they? Yes, they were. Wasn't he the guy who was involved in that little hurly burly about uh, phone the doctor instead of put it in writing? The, uh, I don't, yes, uh, I have had an opportunity, Jack, to research the details of Mr. Miyazawa's uh, departure as a commissioner uh, from uh, the Workers' Compensation Board. And, uh, Jack, I'm satisfied that Mr. Miyazawa will do a good job as chairman of a panel, which is what he, he will, will be. Uh, and on that panel will be a Labour member and will be a management uh, appointee, and uh, where those decisions uh, are subject to review by the commissioner, uh, individuals are going to be able to get a fair hearing and uh, the appointments are temporary until uh, January when the new system comes into place. And are you planning to appoint a new labor-oriented commissioner? At the moment it's three to one, I believe, the other way, employer to uh, Jack, the act doesn't call for uh, labor or management commissioners. The practice has been that there will be labor management uh, commissioners on there. 
when uh, when uh, we uh, like Bev Cormer uh, is the uh, is the uh, Labour Commissioner at the present time. Bev is going to do an outstanding job for uh, all of the parties as a Commissioner of the Board, and. Uh, what we're looking for is capable, qualified people to serve as commissioners and not politicians. You're not going to balance it, two labor and two management? Yes, uh, I'm considering that. You're considering that. That's right. It's in your mind. That's right. And how long did you say it would be before you cleared up the 5,000 backlog, the shameful backlog on appeals? It's sad, Jack, uh, but uh, we'll have uh, the new system in place by January 1 or mid-January, and from then it'll take us 14, 15 months to clear it up. Once that's done, you're looking at 10 days. 10 days. That's right. We're also going to appoint, you should know, Jack, under that system, uh, individuals who, who will be out in the regions hearing those uh, mm -hmm. uh, appeals as well. Uh, right now, uh, the panels move from Vancouver to Prince George, the Cranbrooks, the Camloops, the Colonia. Wasting time. Wasting time. And take them uh, weeks to do them. And they don't meet right through these people. Right. I understand they take their time. Right. And it might take them a week or ten days of meetings to solve a case. Depending on the complexity of the case. And You've got uh, to put the whip on them, too. Well, I've got a few more questions for the Minister of Labour, and then you can come in with your calls right now. It's the most miserable subject, but feel free to have at Terry Secretary, Labour Minister. <laughs> Can you tell me if your unfunded liability is still an unmitigated disaster? No, Because Jack. you were accused of letting the employers off easy with the debts climbing like nobody's business. Because right. the employers pay all of the costs, we should make that clear. That's right. The employers pay the total costs. Uh, there was runaway costs uh, in the operations of the Workers' Compensation Board in uh, 1983. Since then, some tough decisions have been made with respect to reducing costs. Uh, the employer community, Jack, has been taxed the highest in the country to pay those costs and uh, the unfunded liability is down now to $200 million. And that too is a tribute to the uh, Industrial Health and Safety Committees who have reduced the number of accidents in British Columbia by 21% over We the forgot to point time. out too, you've increased the maximum allowable earnings for the purposes of total disability. That's you? right, from uh, uh, up to uh, $40,000, which basically means now an individual can receive pensionable benefits of $30,000. If he's fully total. disabled. That's right. For a long time. That's the maximum you can receive. But you, surely you've told the board to be a lot tougher on claims. No. You sure? No, I don't interfere with that at all. But if anybody could, you're the one that could interfere. No, I wouldn't interfere. Here's an official of, I think it's this Larry Stoffman of the Retail Clerks Union, Larry. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead to the minister and keep it short and sharp. Okay, I have uh, two major questions for the minister. Just give me 15 seconds to give the background of the questions. Uh, in the fall of 1983, there were tripartite uh, regulatory advisory committees. These committees submitted over 40 unanimous recommendations to the WCB, and their top priority was the immediate extension of regulatory protection to farm workers. Uh, Mr. Flesher not only ignored the recommendations, but in your words, I believe, in the paper on pr in the province yesterday, committed all the results of the 84 public hearings to the incinerator. Uh, the labor movement's continuing to call for immediate coverage of farm workers by 1986. Uh, in this coming growing season. So I have two questions following from this background. First one is, why will you not bring in coverage for farm workers this spring, which is three years after the uh, unanimous recommendation to do so? And the second question is, why should the labor movement again participate in a process that your government and Mr. Flesher have made a mockery of by incinerating the results of uh, our past public hearings simply because you don't like the recommendations that come out of the hearings? Well, the uh, process was taking its course in 1983 or thereabouts, and the labor community walked off, uh, walked out of the meetings because uh, they couldn't uh, agree with the process that was taking its course and uh, suggested that uh, they weren't satisfied uh, with the uh, type of regulation that was going to be put in place. When I became minister after discussing with the, uh, the process with industrial health and safety committees, they were concerned that because those regul regulations had the benefit of public hearing, that they were uh, in general terms and uh, not very specific. With respect uh, to uh, the tradition of regulations in the province, uh, they were concerned that because they already had the benefit of public hearing, which would give the Workers' Compensation Board the authority to uh, have the full force of law, uh, Mr. Flesher uh, wasn't satisfied that, uh, that, the, uh, that the regulations were, were strong enough and uh, decided to uh, 
uh, undergo a new process uh, of uh, regulatory reform. Was that when he put them in the incinerator? That's when they were committed to the incinerator. And mm. uh, some people, Jack, were playing politics with, uh, with the regulations as well, saying that uh, Mr. Flesher and the Workers' Compensation Board were going to uh, eliminate regulations in the workplace altogether. And it's my view that if you want to play politics with uh, industrial health and safety in the lives of individuals, that uh, I'm not going to be part of that as Minister of Labour, and neither is the government. Are you going to implement full compensation coverage for farm workers in the spring? Well, Jack, just to be clear, the workers' compensation, uh, uh, farm workers do have full coverage. They regulations. Don't have, they don't have regulations. Right. Uh, the regulations will be distributed to the parties of interest and to the community, and it's up to them the pace that they wish to proceed from, uh, from receiving the regulations. You're going to have hearings on it? They have to discuss them. They have to uh, reach consensus on them. Where we reach consensus, we will implement them after they've received the benefit of public hearings. Thanks, Larry. Go ahead, please. Hey, good morning, Jack, Mr. Minister. Good morning. I have uh, two quick questions. The first one, Jack, is I think we need a bit of background on that reappointment of Roy Miyazawa. Joe Miyazawa. <coughs> Roy Miyazawa. The, you know, the Supreme Joe. Court of Canada four years ago came down with a judgment against the WCB, which forced them to open to allow claimants from the WCB to have access to their medical files. That came down. Mr. Miyazawa at the time went around and counseled WCB doctors as to how to circumvent that, uh, that judgment from the Supreme well, Court of just Canada. Hang on a second. I did give some background on that. I'm well aware of the situation. Okay, well, the, what all right, he said then, was that Joe is going to be the chairman of a board of one board of review but panel. But that's fair enough. I think what it calls into question is the direction that Mr. Segerty is leading the WCB. Well, that may be. Well, number one, uh, I set up a committee. To, to interview uh, the individuals that would sit uh, on the boards of review. Uh, the, uh, those uh, individuals made the decision based on the ability of the individual to carry out the performance of the responsibility in a fair, open and compassionate you, you way. You say Joe's a good opponent. And, uh, and uh, they made that decision and uh, uh, quite frankly it's, it's a good appointee and uh, Mr. Miyazawa will be reassessed again in January based on his performance. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to know if it's legal for, for uh, an employee to fire a guy when he's on work with WCB. Is it legal for an employer to fire a man on compensation? Yeah. Uh, it would depend on the provisions of the collective uh, agreement, Jack. It's not, but, not at uh, union. But, uh, it's not union. I, I would have to know the circumstances surrounding it. Were you fired on compensation? That's right. Uh, would you uh, mm. would you please uh, get in touch with the employment standards branch? I, I did. And, and what did they tell did you? They tell you no. Well, they said it was not legal. That's right. Well, it was, uh, he could fire me any time he wanted to. Okay, hold on a second. We'll talk to you later. I'll talk to him during the break. I don't want to just cut him off. Hey, briefly from Colin Snell. All the union officials want to get at you this morning. That's okay. Go ahead, Colin. Okay, uh, Jack, I would like to ask... Uh, the minister uh, about the uh, fair wage at Expo, uh, the... I just asked him. Yeah, well, the, the answer here again is, uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify a point. We had two people come forward, two workers come forward to us in August. We approached the Minister of Labor, and all the minister, ministry could do at that time was get the difference between straight time and overtime uh, wages for the, these two workers. There's workers on that site right now getting $5 an hour. We have 30 affidavits, and the Expo Corporation are refusing to meet with our union. Okay, let's see your answer to that. Because you surely agree that yep. where they bid on the minimum, federal fair wage minimum, they should be paying these wages. Where an individual has gone out, a company has gone out and bid on a contract based on the wages that they got to pay on the site, the, uh, the employees should receive the benefit of, of that. And... Uh, my deputy, I know, has been in touch with Colin uh, on this, or at least I've asked him to, and uh, we will provide any support we can to, uh, to any individual worker that, uh, that uh, uh, hasn't received the benefit of it. Thanks, Colin. Work. I've got to take a break. I'll be back with Terry Segerty and some more calls after the break. Here's another one to go at the minister. It's Connie Monroe, isn't it? That's right, Jack. Go ahead to tell you secondly, Connie. Well, you know, Jack, I really uh, don't spend an awful lot of time phoning on uh, phone-in shows during the day, but when I uh, hear what uh, the minister has to say this morning, it just makes me really angry because either he doesn't understand the system that he's uh, supposed to be 
uh, being the watchdog for, or else uh, there's, there's really some sort of attempt to misrepresent things. I'll start off, he talks about there's only 5% of the claims that are being uh, turned down by the board. You know, to, to bandy that figure about, and he's done this in the past and has been corrected in the past, but he hasn't corrected his statements on it, that's a really gross misrepresentation. Uh, it's true that in the initial adjudication stage, there's 5% that's turned down. And that 5%, incidentally, is up from about 2% a couple years ago. But uh, that's not where all the appeals are coming from. You wouldn't have a 5,000 appeal backlog at the boards of review if you were only turning down 5%. What's happening is that on the 95% that are accepted, the way those claims are being handled is generating an awful lot of dissatisfaction. And I'll give you an example of the sort of thing that, uh, that gets people upset. There was a lot of uh, good PR, I guess, for Mr. Segerty last week when they announced that the, uh, the ceiling was being raised to $40,000. But you really have to ask yourself, who's, who's going to get the maximum wage rate? The, the, what happens with the board is that when you are first injured, you get uh, your wages based on what you're earning <coughs> at the time of the injury. That used to last for 13 weeks. About a month ago, the board reduced it to eight weeks. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens then is that they take your wages over the past three years and average them out, and that's what they pay you for your wage rate. That's what they pay you for your pension entitlement. Now, the sort of people that are, are likely to receive maximum wage rates, I guess, in this province are probably construction workers and people in the lumber industry. You've got to ask yourself, how many of those people have worked steadily for the past three years? Because the, the board won't take into account anything they've received on UIC benefits. Jack, the average uh, salary in, uh, in a pretty industrialized part of British Columbia, my constituency, is uh, $43,000 a year. But the question is, have That's those it. people and they've been earned $43,000 per year? over the past three years yeah, because that's what they have to do to qualify for uh, for the full wage rate. And they've been getting it longer than that. Ah, but don't tell me you've got 100 percent employment in your writing. I'll tell you, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, probably one of the most fortunate areas in British Columbia where uh, unemployment is about 12 percent. But she's case. making a very good point that, that 95 percent, okay, 95 percent, fair enough, it's the way the board handles them. And she points out that the averaging includes three years, doesn't include UIC, and includes periods of unemployment, correct? Yes. So the point is that you'll have an but awful it's an lot of people it's who, an have, who maybe disability. have earned $40,000 in the past year who are going to get the minimum wage rate paid by the board because they've been unemployed for the two years previous. That'll be true, won't it, because of the vast unemployment? Yes, but the, but the workers' compensation is not a substitute for unemployment insurance benefits. It's a pension or a payment for yes, disability. Yes, it's payment. a payment for disability. Well, nobody's talking about it being a, a substitute for unemployment, uh, Mr. Segerty. What we're saying is that the method of calculating the wage rates is completely unfair. If the, the provision in the Act says that the board should calculate wage rates in the manner with which best represents the loss to the worker. And taking his, uh, his average over the past three years doesn't come anywhere close to doing that. And it's those sorts of policies that are getting the board in hot water and that are causing the incredible backlog at the board's review. As I say further, when you talk about uh, getting rid of the backlog at the board's review over a period of 14 months, you're dreaming. Because as long as uh, the sort of administration that you've got at the WCB is in place there, you're never going to reduce that backlog because those sorts of, of uh, discretionary decisions at every step of the way are being determined in ways that are fundamentally unfair to workers. Connie Monroe, thank you very much. That gave you a good doing, didn't it? Yes. Seems to be a lot of truth in what she says, too. Well, it's, uh, it, it depends on, on uh, where you're coming from, Jack. Uh, the, uh, like the Labor Relations Board has become very legalistic in the past few years, and uh, the uh, legal fraternity out there is looking for full-time employment opportunities with uh, workers' compensation. And uh, You're accusing them uh, of making work for themselves. Well, uh, I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's, a boon, it's getting to be a boondoggle for the lawyer community. I and, really resent but, that, Mr. What, Segerty. What we got to do... What you've done is created an administrative <coughs> system where a person needs to get outside counsel for proper representation, and that shouldn't occur. Well, you the know, point of having an administrative system is one that will operate fairly and efficiently and won't require the person to, uh, to go out and get outside counsel. And I would be very happy to see the, uh, the WCB operate in a way that people don't require lawyers. Yes, and, and uh, we'll do that because we'll be setting up review panels where the worker will have, uh, will have his representative on the board and continue to have his representative on the board. 
and the employer community will continue to have their representative on the board and there'll be a fair and compassionate impartial chairman that will be able to make a decision on the part of the three. Thank the you, John. board review regulations are worse than ever. You know, and you talk about the Miyazawa appointment and say that it's not a problem because he's going to be sitting with two other people, but under your new regulations, he can be sitting alone, can't he? Well, just a second. The, the regulations uh, are going out to the parties of interest, the employer and the labor community. And I would hope that those lay people in, in the employer and labor community would be able to sit down and agree on the regulations. And uh, once they've agreed on the regulations, we're prepared to put them in place and uh, in, on the theory that if the parties agree to the regulations, that they're going to have respect for the regulations and to be able to proceed in a fair, impartial and compassionate way. Thank you, Connie Monroe. Okay, thank you, Jack. I'll be back with Teddy Sigurdy after the break. <laughs> Go ahead to Terry Segerty. Yes, my question is how much influence uh, Mr. Segerty had on uh, bringing in uh, WCB's uh, uh, work and worth it, work ethics at the campus of PBI, PBI and the other two campuses. Don't under, what are you getting at? Uh, Say it bluntly. I think it's a good idea that they have this program, and I think they should do it at a lot of other schools. And it happened when before when the Liberals were in power. Are you talking about retraining at BCIT and PBI? Yeah. Do you do that, Ted? Yes, uh, the Workers' Compensation uh, Board. It's a run policy of the board, there. and they run some educational courses. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I went to the minister. Um, when a company goes bankrupt, um, the injured employee should be under Section 99, I believe, but they don't give the benefit of the doubt to the employee, the injured employee, um, when the company does go bankrupt. What does that mean? Well, uh, they just uh, continually put the, pass the buck. They send you to the commissioners, and the commissioners bypass it, and take okay. six months after the board's review type thing. And uh, I was told, like, before I went to the commissioners, that it would not win at the commissioner's level. What do you mean? When your company went bankrupt, your payments, no, your payments still come from the WCB, don't they? Oh, they were cut off shortly after the company went bankrupt. Do you think it was because of the bankruptcy? Uh, I believe so, yes, because the benefits come from the company back into the WCB system. I'll tell you what, I'd like to do some research uh, on that, if we could have your name and phone number off the line. I, I'm, I'm not too sure about that, but it, uh, from my understanding is that within the category uh, that's, uh, that, that they're being assessed within, that that category pays out the benefits from that category. Will you check it out and I, let me I, know? I'd, I'd like to check that out. Thanks Go for the ahead, call. Go ahead, please. Mr. Segerty, good morning. Uh, morning. My question in involves the uh, experience rated claim structure or premium structure for workers' compensation, uh, which should charge the employers. Now, do you not feel that this, in fact, will just encourage employers to violate Section 13 of the Act? And well, knowing this, what sort of safeguards uh, do you plan on putting in place to uh, make certain that this does not happen? As it's happening now, even without a uh, an experience rated claim structure. Well, if it's happening now and you know it, uh, I'd like to get the name of the employer that's, uh, that's violating the act, and uh, uh, I'd uh, have the Workers' Compensation Board check into it. And I'm surprised that uh, if you know that it's happening, that you haven't contacted them already. Oh, it has been done, and the, mat the individual matter has been resolved. But, uh, well, in that case, uh, the, with, the, the with act. What kind of uh, measures do you plan on meeting such uh, future uh, cases? will no doubt stem from a, an experience rated premium. Well, uh, uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of conscious individuals out there like yourself that, uh, that will police that, and certainly the trade union movement in British Columbia will police it, and I'd like to know the names of any violators. And just send them direct to you at That's your office, right. and you'll get to see the mail. It'll be done. Mind you, you come into this job, you've got to learn the whole thing from bottom up, haven't you? That's right, Jack. That's why I didn't take that other call, because I'm yeah. not, I'm not that sure. you're still learning. It. Every day you learn. Go ahead from Kelowna. Hi, Jack. Mr. Segerty. Good morning. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I cut the end of my thumb off and uh, and was compensated for it. And uh, just recently, I went back to the doctor and uh, he checked out the grafting he had done and he says that I'm going to have to have it regrafted uh, sometime in the new year. So what's your problem? They'll do it for you, won't they? They'll do it. Yeah. Uh, 
what my question is, will I be uh, compensated for that? Well, I'm sure if you, uh, if, if you get in touch with uh, the workers' compensation office in your community, uh, they'll be able to deal with that question for you. Yeah, if he has to stop work to get That's some right. more treatment for his thumb, you'd think he'd be covered. That's right. Look, I only do compensation boards every now and again. I'm sure can Connie Monroe put you in your place. Absolutely. Maybe next time you ask the questions, you'll know all the answers. The, uh, Jack, every day is a new experience, and uh, I'm new at the job, and uh, trying to find out about it as we go through. Well, and the union movement and, seems uh, to like you. I think the union move movement thinks that you're capable of some applying a touch of compassion and humanity to an otherwise soulless cabinet. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. That's a compliment We've to got you. a pretty good group of colleagues. The top of the morning to you, Terry Segerty. I landed here in 66 from the old sod. What part of the old sod? Just north of Dublin. Just north uh, of Dublin. In County Mead. Uh-huh. On Wilthig am I? No, no, no Gaelic here today. <laughs> Keen meal fell cheap. And I'll be back. What am I doing after it? The man with a thousand jobs after the break. Bernard Fay is 39. Wow. Like many other British Columbians, he lost his job. He created his own job. But first of all, uh, first of all, tell me a little bit about how and when you lost your job and what kind of situation you faced. Well, I was chief cost engineer on the Quintet Coal Project. Unlike most people in the construction industry, when one job is coming to an end, then you know that you have to find the link over into a new job. This was a pretty big job. Oh, it was, absolutely. And so probably three or four months from the end, I started to write around to various projects that were possibly going ahead to try and find a new job and didn't find one. Then the end of construction was finished at Quintet and of course my job finished with it. And that left me in a position of having to... And what did you do to find another job? What steps did you take as a, a well, skilled, uh, competent cost analyst, is it? No, a cost control engineer. Cost control engineer. What did you do to look for a job? Did you just do the odd phone call? No, no, I didn't. I've got a, a mini computer at home, and so I went down to the library, found out just about every construction and engineering company that existed in, in North America and back in the UK and Canada, and then uh, used the mini computer, wrote to all of these employers and uh, outlined the, the fact that Quintet had gone successfully from a construction point of view, and uh, tried to find out what the prospects were of employment. That didn't get too much response. How many letters would go out in your mini-computer that oh, way? Probably a thousand or so uh, at the first, first batch. At the first mailing? Yes. This was you in your resume looking for a job anywhere yes. in the world? Anywhere in the world. How many positive responses did you get? Uh, very few, very few. Uh, most of the people were saying, we'll, we'll keep your resume on file. Thank you for writing to us. We're not hiring at the moment. We're actually laying people off ourselves. And so there was very poor response. You got dozens of interviews lined up though, didn't you? Well, no. What I did after that was to try and make things easier for the employer. I decided that I would do a trip around North America and visit uh, all of the major cities. So I then used the, the computer again and said, I will be in your city, whatever your city happens to be, on, on such and such a date, figuring that I would then join up the dots on the map and visit whoever gave me a positive response. And you did? And I did. How long did that take you? Oh, it took sort of two trips of about four weeks each. And as the months pass by, it says here you steadily built up a stack of 2,000 reject letters. Right. Right. What is the job, because of this experience, per perhaps, uh, that you have created for yourself? Well, I thought that everybody was quite possibly in the same position of realizing that the amount of possible jobs that they could get was now very much reduced as opposed to sort of what it was five or ten years ago. So therefore, I went to Vancouver Library uh, with the idea of let's look at all of the newspapers from across Canada and see on a regular basis whether or not my job is or isn't in there. When I went there, I found that the newspapers from the East Coast were probably two weeks old by the time they got to Vancouver, which meant as far as writing for a job in Ottawa was concerned, you, you, you probably missed it. And that was the, the time when I thought to myself, maybe it's going to be a good idea to get a magazine going, which in effect is the addition of all of the jobs in Canada and put that on the market as a, as a So you get every day and every way, you get every newspaper, you select all the, all well, jobs or just certain well, kinds of jobs? Well, all of the display ads. All display ad if the, jobs. If, if the job is in a box, then it's in the magazine. That, and you publish it in a magazine which you call? 
No, you call it a thousand career. Well, no, the company's called a thousand careers. This but is called jobs, called jobs, jobs, jobs. Right. In this are a thousand one tags. Yes. From newspapers all over North America. Not all over Canada. All over Canada. Mm -hmm. Giving people an opportunity to apply for these jobs. Yes. Right? And what do you charge to be on your subscription list, which is well, what your new job is, selling this pamphlet? Well, selling that, right. Well, there are two subscription rates, one's for three months and one's for six months. And for three months, it's 4150 and for six months, it's 7150 4150 Now, obviously, you're going to get the executive... Are these all executive-type jobs? Well, no. If, if they're in a box, they're in the magazine. That's the basic outline. What categories thing. do you cover? Well, we've got 38 categories on the back, Jack. So... Obviously, the, the biggest category now is computing, but certainly a lot of jobs in uh, engineering, medical, accountancy. Uh, How many subscriptions have you sold up to now? Oh, probably close to 400, something like that. 400 subscriptions. Uh -huh. Have you any feedback on any people who have obtained positions from one of your collated, up-to-date one tads for all these different kinds of careers? Oh, quite a bit of feedback, yeah. In fact, the first person that we ever found a job for was a subscriber in Germany who wanted to get back to Canada, took the magazine after having seen the average in the Globe and Mail, got in touch with us, uh, took a subscription, and then after uh, probably six or seven weeks wrote and said, you don't need to send me any more, don't even send me a refund, we've uh, found a job, and thanks very much for your help. Well, that's very good. And if I, if I were to flip this open right now, what would I see? Hell of a lot of computer, business consultant, office management, purchasing, Ottawa, Edmonton, Calgary, Montreal, Oshawa, many in Vancouver, not that many, are there? Well, I would say about 10% are in Vancouver. 10 I, I usually them. find on a typical week, there'll be about 100 out of Vancouver, 300 and odd out of Alberta, and then the rest you move into the east. That's very good. So you found yourself a job? I certainly did. Well, I don't mind giving you a plug, because if somebody might well want to subscribe to this, looking for jobs in any part of the world, mm -hmm. what's the information for the people, please? 669 Jobs, Box 600, West Broadway, Vancouver, British Columbia. That's great. But you don't plan to do this for the rest of your life, do you? Oh, I, I find it a fascinating subject. And certainly the subject of the unemployed in BC and in Canada. Very crafty, Very because your material, your material costs you virtually nothing. Well, production costs, printing costs are high. I'd like to have cheaper printing costs, but... Uh, and, of course, you get the information in your source of supply is the classified ads and the Globe and Mail and all the big newspapers. Well, not, not the classified, but... The display the, ads. The display ads, And yeah. you cut them down tightly and sharply. We abbreviate them all, yeah. We leave out all of the superfluous words about how big the company is. Uh, and the company's sort of self-advertisement. If you... You're not really a career counsellor, but if you were going up to the end of a job, what would you go for? It has to be computing. Has Any, to be computing. Has to be. Any child that's going through the school system now that decides not to take a computer course is, is, is in effect saying, I think I'll leave out reading and writing. I, I, I'm not going to need that subject. That, that's, you really mean that? I really mean that. But you only need one computer program for a whole factory building 10 million widgets, which used to be done by individuals. But you need a lot of clones who can run the computer. You need the people to run them, yeah. I think so they're clones. In the computing industry, you need people from the top to the bottom. You need the guy who is extremely clever, and you also need the guy who knows not much more than how to stick the plug on the end of the wire. The top 5% will always get jobs, won't they? Yes, they will. Because nowadays, if you get 50 applications or 150 applications as an employer, you can afford to take the cream of the crop. Absolutely. But give me that again about computers. You say that if a child does not take computer courses, there's no job for them in the market unless they become a professional of some kind. Well, we're talking about percentages. I mean, I mean there's certainly there's going to be some jobs for people who haven't got any sort of computing skill. Or but, waitresses. But, right. But, but by and large, anybody that doesn't have some sort of computer literacy is going to find it that much more difficult to get a job. Well, how come you took the computer so early in life or when? Well, I think there's two types of people. When, when the computer industry got rolling probably 20 years ago, then it either fascinates you or frightens you. Uh, and certainly there are a lot of people in their late 50s who know that they can get to retirement without getting close to a computer. Not so for anybody in their 40s or younger. Got to be a computer. Got to be. Okay, jobs, jobs, jobs. 669 jobs is Bernard Fay's number. And I'll be back with my little story about Flora MacDonald and some details of immigration policy, which I feel honor bound to correct after the break. Thank you.
let me set the stage. As a, I'm still a bit of a reporter, and I try to keep the record straight. Uh, a couple of days ago, at the beginning of the week, I interviewed Charlie Campbell. Here's Charlie, back again, former vice chairman of the Immigration Appeal Board. And he was expressing his concern about immigration abuses. I <coughs> expressed my concern about them before, too, based principally on the only official in the country who seems to take notice of them, and that is our intrepid Auditor General. When I was interviewing Charlie, uh, I was kind of horrified to, be, to get the reconfirmation that family unification, widely used as part of our immigration policy, which brings in mothers and fathers and siblings, that's five or six brothers and sisters, as a matter of right, when there is one citizen in this country, you can bring in a whole family. I was uh, horrified to reconfirm that 50% of the parents, who are the whole focal point of the family unification, do not stay in Canada. They bring the siblings here, and once the siblings are here, they go back to whence they came. Now, there I was the other day, and I wasn't harassing Flora, I was merely trying to get my facts correct. And here is what the little interchange between us. The Liberals in 1978 changed the age of parents who could be brought in from 60 to 40. Well, it's been changed again. It's back up to 60. When was it changed up to in 60? In 1982. Are you sure it's up to yeah. 60? Now, that was where Flora was wrong. In 1979, and I've confirmed this with Flora's top officials, there are provisions whereby people can bring in parents of over 60 in certain circumstances. But a blanket change was made in 1978, which allows immigrants to this country to bring in parents of any age. I used the term 40. I, I was wrong. It's, a citizen can bring in parents and siblings of any age at all. And that, of course, creates some social problems. Forgetting even the problem that 50% of the courier parents, it is believed, return to the country of their origin. Now, what's the significance of the fact that from 1978, parents of any age can be brought in by Canadian citizens who become citizens here as a matter of right after three years in this country? Well, until 1978, as you've just said, the, the uh, citizen in this country who came as an immigrant uh, was able to nominate uh, family, siblings, who would come in on merit under a point system and have some advantage if they had family in the country, and that made sense. They were also able to sponsor their parents if they were over 60 or younger if they were disabled and needed the care and attention of their successful children in this country, and that made sense. Now, in 1978, they said that parents of any age can be sponsored, and as you said, they can bring in all of their dependent children under 21 with them by a matter of right, regardless of their capacity to meet any kind of selection criteria in this country. That opened the gates to people from the less advantaged nations who recognize this country as God's promised land. There's no question about it. We're better off than anybody else in the world, and anybody from these disadvantaged countries recognizes this, and they want to come. So it opened up the opportunities for the marriage of convenience, which is a well-established device for people without character, to get somebody in the family married to somebody in Canada, either legitimately or on a... Uh, convenient spaces, spaces and bring in a family and it opened up the opportunity that you've just set out for courier parentage where the family would be ill at ease in our society but are anxious for the well-being of their kids and so they bring them in and quite often they're people who are not capable of successfully establishing in the country and How the can thing say is that the man that you just had on told us that if anybody's going to get anywhere in this country, they have to have some computer knowledge. And we are bringing in large numbers of people who haven't. Now, what's serious about, about what Flores McDonald did 
was she made a statement to you that was false. Now, I don't believe that she was lying. No, no, no. What is, what is, what is, is terribly, what is terribly important is that she's been in that office for 15 months. She is anticipating, as she told you, changes in the Immigration Act. And she demonstrated that she doesn't understand the fundamental principles and the background of the whole immigration policy and how it's developed. And she's going around the country making these statements without any, any background at all. Look, I'm That's probably, serious. I'm probably the only person in the country who would ask her a question about courier parents. I'm not willing to be quite so hard on Flora as you are. But that's the reason I did it this morning, because I didn't want to leave the wrong information with the public. A citizen can bring a parent of any age and all siblings under 21. That's right. Regardless of their potential to succeed or adjust in this country. Right. Is there any control on the quality of the siblings? No control at all. Can the you only control is that if they have serious health problems or criminality problems. But beyond that, there's no control. Do the siblings require to have guaranteed jobs when they come to the country? Not at all. It's a matter of right. The, the sponsor must, uh, must uh, uh, agree to support them for 10 years when they're here. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen. And there are large numbers of them, once they get here, are on go, go income on assistance, income welfare, assistance, all kinds of things. Because the sponsor, with the best will in the world, loses his job. And, and you can't sponsor them. We're certainly not going to deport the siblings, are we? They're, they, we're, we're not doing anything about that at all. Ten years on the Immigration Appeal Board, I only ever dealt with one case where people were deported because they weren't maintaining themselves. One case? In ten years. So signing a sponsorship to look after somebody is just gobbledygook. It's, it, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Charlie, as you know, it's, this is a very delicate subject, and one doesn't want to make anybody unwelcome in the country. Is there an answer? For instance, the officials will tell you, off the record, that they're fearful of all these courier prisons, but they can't prove it, they say. They can't prove the numbers. They say the Auditor General picks these figures, but they can't prove that there are that many ghost parents. Well, the officials, the officials are saying they can't prove it, but remember in his 1982 report, the Auditor General, uh, the people, the audit was done in all of the immigration offices abroad and in the regions of Canada. And the Auditor General reported that, these, that, that he found from all of these stations that these abuses were taking place. He found, he found this information from the people who were dealing with immigration and dealing with the subject of, of immigration. And, and that they all reported this information to Ottawa and that Ottawa didn't bother to record it. So that how in the devil can the bureaucrats in Ottawa make rational statements on this subject when they pay no attention to the people in the field? In fact, the Auditor General said that headquarters of the immigration does not systematically collect data on the abuses even though every immigration center visited during the audit reported such practices. Right. That was in 82. Things may be different now. The, I don't know. I haven't got that information. But the Auditor General, in his report this year, did a three-year update. And uh, in connection with that attitude, in his 1982 report, he was concerned that large numbers of immigrants were incapable of being successfully established in this country. Though in the preamble to the Immigration Act, it says that admission requires that they be su have the capacity to successfully establish themselves, even though they're members of the family class. But uh, doesn't everybody have the capacity to successfully establish themselves? In 1982, the only uh, rule that the department had uh, about whether they were successfully established was whether or not they were on welfare. Uh, that was the limit, and that's the way the Auditor General expressed it. Uh, in his 1982 report, uh, he, he tells us that uh, subsequent to his, in his 1985 report, he tells us that subsequent to 1982, they did a study, and they acknowledged that there are significant numbers of people in the family class who are incapable Charlie, of successfully establishing you were, themselves. you were 10 years on the Immigration Appeal Board. I want to take a couple more minutes with you. You were 10 years on the board. You dealt with all abuses, loopholes, fraud. And the teachers to California, that that's the brain drain. Mm. We're losing 50, and they're all going to countries with, that have selective rules. We're losing good people. On the other hand, in a completely uncontrolled system that Ms. McDonald apparently doesn't understand, full we're of bringing, loopholes. Full of loopholes. We're bringing in 45,000 
many of whom the, uh, the, the uh, officials in Ottawa acknowledge can't successfully establish themselves, even though that's a requirement of the act. Charlie, you know as well as I do that it would be, there's not one party in this country that would, would politically take a move to reduce or tighten up the abuses in immigration. This is one of the tragedies. And one after the other, when governments fail to do what they know to be in the best interest of this country, they lose the right to govern. The moment you said you were going to tighten up, you'd be accused of racial discrimination. I don't, uh, you I know, may be I'm, accused of that. I'm not but that's, accusing you of that. That's, that's, that's not necessary. All you do is change the rules and perhaps bring them back to what existed before 1978. Look, let's get it, in, let's get it into perspective. If a young lady from Victoria meets a young man from Halifax at the University of Toronto, and they marry and settle in Guelph. It is not part of our culture or the culture of any other people in the world that all their mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters should join them in Guelph. That's nonsense. But that is the fundamental basis of our immigration policy. Now, there isn't any reason why, when somebody leaves home to go and make their way in the world, everybody should follow them. If their brothers and sisters decide that they would like to go too, they can make their application, or they should be able to make their application and get some advantage because they've got family in Canada. Extra points. Extra points. It makes sense. And all we have to do is take the one section that was put into the Act in 1978 out and revert to the situation that existed before that time. It is not directed at any race or creed or color or anything else. It just has general application. And it can be done on the basis that the present system is subject to abuses, that we have vast unemployment, we still need immigration, but we've got to have immigrants who can fit into our society, and, and we can build our immigration from the families of these people on the basis of merit. And give them extra points for unification, but not unlimited total uh, access to Canada as a matter of right. Certainly, recognize that family is important. Well, Charlie, it's a subject nobody talks about. Well, not enough people talk about it. But you've Just you and I, Jack. You've, well, we, 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 we've spelled it out, I think, clinically. Yeah. And I'm not mad at Florida. I mean, I don't blame a minister for not knowing a technical detail. I used the wrong number anyway, 40, when it should have been any age. Well, so I think we, you're very kind because this is more than the technical detail because it's that clause that controls the, the abuses, that makes the abuses possible and results in the flow of 45,000 people. My thanks to Charlie Campbell, former vice chairman of the Immigration Appeal Board, a man of considerable talents. And I'll be back with a free for all after the news. <laughs> I was going to raise a couple of things in the free for all. One of them was the, this new equity share investment where the government says it's going to put up $100 million to help you buy $2,500 worth of stock. Right at the moment, without the regulations, without knowing the qualified shares, it looks like a stock market touts dream. It really does. Where I can go out and buy $10,000 worth of stock in a qualified eligible company if I knew what it was. It's not out yet. Uh, 20, and the government will loan me $2,500 interest-free, and if I make money, I can take my profit, and if I lose money, the government shares the loss. Now, they say this is for the encouragement of small business development, you know, and job-producing plants. The government had better produce the details very shortly, or it will be widely criticized as a stock market touts dream. Now... Free for all. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Just the topic I wanted to bring up was the equity investment plan. Show me the act, will you? You bet. Go on. Okay, so I was listening yesterday morning to three, uh, three financial consultants on the radio. They had a little panel, and they were discussing this program here. And they hooted and derided that thing clear across the country. It was on a national program. And the one thing that they did agree on was the, who the main beneficiary of that act will be. And it will be the underwriters of the scheme, $100 million. And the number one beneficiary will be Peter Brown of Canna Rim Investments. I'm not saying that about Peter. Oh, uh, you're not saying no, that. No, you're not saying financial that. financial people that are from the financial community. Just by from, the way, uh, just by the way, how many times have you phoned me lately? Lately, I've probably phoned you about six or seven times. Well, that's too often. Share the calls. I don't like people that hog. 
Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. M M I'm one of these people that's on uh, workman's compensation. I'm waiting for an appeal. I've been cut off of workman's compensation. I've been cut off of UIC. I'm waiting to go in front of the review board. And I think a solution to the, this thing, sh uh, TV stations should get onto it and get some celebrities together and have a TV show and uh, bring these uh, workman's compensation people and uh, well, no, it's up take to a game show out of it because that's what they're doing right now. It, I was so glad that Connie Monroe got on this morning because she nailed the minister quite severely on some of his figures and statistics. And I thought she did, but it isn't helping us people. It's the politicians that have got to do the fight and the media, of course. One of the troubles with compensation is it's such an incredibly painful subject and so full of individual problems that you, I can't, if somebody comes to me with a WCB case, I can't assess his case and say whether or not he's been badly treated. The file is that thick, the documents are incomprehensible, it goes back years and years and years, and it was an accident or it was a degenerative nerve injury of the back, and there's an argument over that. Well, that's it's, one of my problems. I know, it's one of everybody's problems. Yeah. The only, th the only thing that can save compensation is compassionate, intelligent, reasonable uh, administration of the act, because there are a lot of scams and compensation too. I but, can agree with that, yes. So, but no, I can't uh, possibly go for a celebrity panel. I'll <laughs> keep my eye on, eye on it from time to time as I can. What's that? Let's take this one early. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Yeah. Uh, given that the BCTV, or uh, the corporation, is a corporate sponsor at Expo, what assurances can you give us that your program and the, and the news hour won't change their tenor of reporting? On well, Expo. you've certainly got my assurance, and I'm sure the news hour's assurances. If something scandalous and horrifying happens at Expo, or if the first week is solid rain and nobody goes, do you think we're going to say it's a wonderful success? We will report it as we've always done it. I, I, and I don't think there's the slightest fear for any holdback or qualification on that. If you don't trust me or you don't trust the news out, too bad. I think they're trustworthy. Well, well. Was that a self-serving answer? It probably was. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Morning. I need information. Uh, I spoke to you the other day on the phone, and we're talking about the pulp and paper industry. I know down east, especially because I'm from Quebec, the pulp and paper industry is booming down there. And here in British Columbia, it is dead. Can you please give me an answer on that? Because yes. Yes, I can. Provincial taxation is much more onerous here. Costs of production are much more onerous here. And what, with all this land claim and uh, non-availability, they say, of logs for the pulp mills, who knows how much costs will, or, and export of logs, will go up. We priced ourselves out of the market last year with a very bad strike. And uh, we're going to have to be very tough and very competitive to survive in the pulp mill industry in the way in which we did before. How long have you been in BC? I've been here now seven months. How many jobs have you applied for? About uh, 200 jobs. How many replies have you had? About uh, 2%, 3%. What's your trade? I'm a sales rep, a technical sales rep in the pulp and paper industries and different fields. Perhaps you, what will you do, go back to Ontario or Quebec? No, I'm not. I'm looking forward for something within a few days. I hope to, you know, I enjoyed this project very much, but I feel that jobs first is very important. I remember a few weeks ago, you had the chairman of BC Hydro, and I feel that BC Hydro should go ahead and go with new projects to sell electricity to California like other provinces are doing right now. Well, that may well this is the only way to create jobs. That may well come about, and the best of luck, and thanks for your call. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Jack. Um, morning. I was listening to Connie Monroe this morning when you were, um, had your WCB fellow on. We have had the same instance where we have been cut down from $900 a month, which was full, down to 720 And now they have turned around and taken the uh, pension settlement that my husband is already getting of $45 a month and deducted it off. Um, what I would like to know is how do I get a hold of this Connie Monroe to tell her my circumstances? Connie Monroe is a lawyer. Her number is in the book. Okie dokie. Go ahead, please. Is that the right one? Yes. Yes, it's me? That's you, sir. Yeah, I talked to Grace McCarthy on your program earlier this week. Not and this, the program not she was talking program. about pumping $70 million into BC. 
Not this program you didn't. No, no, it was uh, a couple of days ago. And I w she said to go down to the manpower, so I went down there, and it's uh, not um, as open to older people as you might think. It's it's more if you have some sort, if you can prove you have some trouble getting a job, like a speech impediment or that sort of thing, or if you're really overaged. What program are you talking about? Well, she was saying there's a... Uh, if you've been unemployed for 24 weeks. Oh, yeah. And they're pumping $70 million in this job development program. But you couldn't get into it. How old are you? Uh, 33. What do you do? What, what's your trade, if any? Engineer's technician, construction. You're an engineer's technician qualified? Uh, not a technologist, no, but four years. But because you're 33 and because you, you have been unemployed for how long? Uh, since April. April. Is that 24 weeks? Yeah. So as far as you're concerned, yeah. the program is no good. No, I'm not old enough, not young enough, and I don't have a speech impediment or, a, you know, a bad leg or something. So it's more for that. It wasn't really as, as open as it appeared to be. And I, just, I, believe I went down there, I didn't know anything about it. The people down there didn't know anything about it. And I was just wondering if anybody would be coming in, you know, to maybe tell us about it. what they're looking for. Well, let's find out about that and the $70 million special development project, right? That's what you said, yeah, 24 weeks and over unemployed. Okay, we'll see what we can find out about it. I can't remember the details. I'll be back after the break. Go ahead, please. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Webster. Well, I'd like to comment on what the learned immigration official had to say before. Yeah. I'm an, I'm an immigrant in Canada. I've been here since 1970. I'm currently a graduate student at uh, UBC. Uh -huh. And what I wanted to point out was I, I, I agree with him in totality about what he said in the, in the fact that with the deficit being a problem in Canada right now, we as Canadian taxpayers cannot afford to have social payments and transfer payments going out to people to, for example, parents of immigrant sons who make no contribution to, to, to the Canadian economy in any way, shape, or form. It's a very dicey and delicate situation, but we must face up, at least we can face up to the abuses. Maybe we can, I don't know if it's the immigration department, I think it's more the government policies than the immigration department right. that creates unbelievable situations which the officials cannot cope with. Yeah. At the same time, I'd also like to comment that I believe the learned immigration official may have been overstating his position because I, for a fact, know that uh, my father's brother has been trying to come into the country, and he's got about uh, three hundred thousand dollars cash lying around, trading in treasury bills all the time, and he's not—he's not unhealthy or anything, and yet somehow he's been rejected for coming into Canada. Your father's brother does not qualify as family reunification unless he has a sibling, unless he has a Canadian citizen living in this country. Now, as far as the 300,000 is concerned, until recently it was quite obvious that all you had to do was to flash your bank book or a certified check or, and you could walk into the country. And I would suggest that if your father, if your uncle does want to establish a business, he could still make it as an entrepreneurial migrant. Okay. But I think the, the, the Globe and Mail did an expose on the fact that the immigration department was not following it up on what happened to these entrepreneurial immigrants. In oh. fact, out of 1065, they couldn't find 429 of them later on. They just come in here as landed immigrants. They'll, they'll be using that to get status in this country and use this country when it's good and handy for them to use. Right, and if I may, if I may, if I may make one more comment uh, yes. just on a different topic about education and the Socred government. Mm -hmm. I'm here from Ontario and I know that you're quite a supporter of the Socred government. Oh, nonsense. Don't be stupid. Supporter of the government. Of the Socred government. Me. No? You're crazy. I'm sorry, I guess. You know, you're mine. My God. Because I was nice to Teddy Secretary doesn't mean I like social credit, for God's sake. I've lived under social credit for most of the last 30 I think years. I think they've erred greatly in their education, in, in not supporting the educational institutions as much as they have, because that's the only way that the Canadian economy is going gonna, is gonna to establish, I mean, Canada is going to establish itself at the forefront of the technological... I've lost interest in everything you said. Go, go, go ahead, please. Yes, I Jack. I didn't mean to be nasty. <laughs> what are you laughing at? You're, you're just being normal. Yeah. Sometimes, but most of the times you're delightful. Thank you. Did I understand Mr. Shagerty to say that in his home writing, uh, his unemployment rate was... 10%, he said. 12%? 10. 
And, or did he say 10? He said 10. He said 12. He said 12, did he? Yeah, did he? and I wouldn't think that that would be acceptable. I would think uh, he's about 5% too high. And if that's where he's coming from, he's got a long way to go. He comes from Fanny. Well, we've got to work a little harder to get unemployment down in this province. We're, today's stats were what, 14% in Vancouver? 14.5. Yeah, it's still much, much too high. And in many towns, it's 25%. Don't kid yourself. Well, that's deplorable. Okay, bye. Much obliged. Thank you. Bye. Wave some fingers. Hello. Go ahead, please. Hello, Webster. Um, I was wondering whether you had read where these five boys in Toronto murdered a homosexual, and they were from 15 to 18 years old. No, I didn't read it. And they ended up getting nine years apiece, 15 to 18. Then we have a 17-year-old killer here in Vancouver. He hacks a man to death. Eight hours later, he attacks another one in the same way. Are we in the same country? You follow me? Yeah, I follow you. That latter one is under appeal at the moment. I don't know the circumstances of the first one, but the administration of justice ain't all that swift in this country at the moment, I'll tell you. It's not the administration of justice, it's the laws more. Go ahead from where? Lyle Island? No, this is from Vancouver. Um, calling about, uh, I used to work for Frank Bevan at Thurston Harbor in 1973. And when I was working there, I could see that the uh, logging done in the uh, wharf for the uh, spruce, uh, for the planes at that time, uh, you could hardly tell that it was logged at all. And uh, when I did leave Thurston Harbor, I have been back since, and uh, Thurston Harbor, you can uh, see that the reforestation on its own has been done naturally, and uh, logging Lyle Island, I feel, <coughs> is not harming the uh, environment at all. Well, I agree with you, I'm, but it, I'm much more intrigued uh, interested to see what happens in the disposition of Mr. Sven Robinson's case when it comes up on the reserve judgment of the Chief Justice. Go ahead, please. Morning, Jack. Morning. Uh, I'd just like to comment on, like, with everybody uh, having hard times with WCB. Um, I've had three or four claims with them over the past uh, few years, and I've never had a problem. I was pretty impressed with the speed that the claims went through. Good. Oh, you're patting them on the back. Well, I was... You know, I had no problems with them. So well, that's <laughs> good. Congratulations to them and to you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I uh, listened to Charlie Campbell this morning, and I came into Canada three years ago as an immigrant. We had to prove we could keep ourselves. We came in as retirement. And looking back to England like it is now, with all the riots and all these people without unemployment, and they're talking now that it's race relations. They make their own problems, these dark people. I mean, they come in and they are the only ones that matter. They don't come in and want to live in the country. You can't say that about every immigrant to the country. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning. Um, Mr. Webster? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. I, during the last month, Mr. Webster, I had reason to be an observer in one of our courts. Yes, ma'am. Near the prison, mm -hmm. Main Street. I'd like to suggest that some of our um, people who work in shift work or out of work or housewives go down sometime and observe what's going on in those courtrooms. It's an eye-opener. You're talking about the police courts? Yes, I believe so. The one next door to the prison. I am, I'm 50 years old, you know, and I have gone through my life assuming that our law and everything is just perfect and people that complain are troublemakers. Ma'am, the best education in any city and where... It gives you the best feeling for it is to go and sit in the police courts and move from place to place and watch them. It's yeah, better just walk in quietly. You can, you know, there's nobody stops you nobody going stops. in. Just sit on the back roads. And you will learn more about this country in a couple of weeks than you'd learn in a month and Sundays of reading newspapers and watching exactly. television. I've seen very polite young lawyers. I've got to go, my dear. My, judges my, that got out of the bed on the wrong side. My time is up, love. Catch me earlier another day, and I'll be back after the break. <laughs> Bishop Remy Deru will be here on Monday on a peace mission, nothing to do with Nanus Bay. Is that right, Steve? And uh, later, and Julia Stoller of the Physicians for Social Responsibility, and James Boren, when in doubt, mumble. One of our favorite people of all time. At 9 a.m. precisely.
when you grow kiss curls, that means that you're becoming famous, you see. Yes, see? What's your biggest hit up to now, Katie? Um, my biggest hit? Oh, mm. the Webster Show. No, 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 no. Jack is uh, the, the president. the chairman of the, president of the fan club, the Katie Lang fan club. He's the Kaya Yuppie number one. <laughs> <laughs> We could put out a family album. A duet like Dolly and Kenny. Yes, every bit is good too. Every, oh, better, Jack, better. Expo 86, 147 days to go. What happened? Let's do it again anyway. When in doubt, mumble with James Boren, Monday, 9 a.m. precisely.